pleasure to, to speak here. There's a, a spectrum of uh, experience and backgrounds and interests, so it makes it challenging to try to select something uh, about China that would be of interest to all, so I'll take my best shot. But what I wanted to do, as Howard said, that when we set up our first operation in China in 85. We set up a joint venture in Guangzhou, and we're playing around at that time. And there wasn't a lot of activity, only some large companies that were like General Electric and others who were pretty brave and doing some things in China. And then, as you know, in 1989, everything stopped with Tiananmen Square, but then soon after, it exploded. And we fortunately were on the ground for that explosion. So we probably worked on 800 assignments for 300 or so multinational companies from General, you know, from General Motors to 3M to Caterpillar to increasingly a lot of small and mid-sized companies, which I'll talk a little bit about. But uh, one of the reasons I was to ask a lot of questions because I don't know anything. So um, it, it, I learn something new every day in China. And, and the pace of change in China is so rapid. I go, I commute every month now, and I'm only two years in Tucson from Chicago. And uh, if I'm gone more than a month from China, I, I think I'm out of the flow. So it, it's that rapid uh, development. So anyway, I'm going to give you a little bit of perspective. What I hope is kind of street smart, of on the ground experience of Western companies, largely US companies in China, and some lessons learned and some perspective on where China's going. I think the important thing to appreciate in China, and it's true even for the, the audience in this room, that China, whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, touches your world, certainly as a consumer, but also in, in business. And at some point in your supply chain or your value chain, you know, suppliers, customers, people you work with, they're being affected by China. So understanding where China is going, its impact on the world, or just as a, as a citizen, uh, uh, is, is very important. So um, I'll give you some sense of that, hopefully, today. I think the, the first thing to appreciate, if I get in your way, is that um, China is very young as a developed or Western business kind of market. It's, it's truly a market economy today. Uh, shifting over the last 30 years from a command economy, uh, but the roots are very shallow. We like to uh, draw an analogy with human development, and, and many of you maybe have, have raised teenagers as I have, and it's, so you can, it's not, China's not that difficult, but you get the sense of China really coming out of that late teen development. So it's a bit rebellious, it's not fully mature, uh, it's subject to rapid changes. And so what you see in China on the surface, if you've been there two years ago is a long time, but uh, is it, it can look quite developed. And uh, laws on the books, like intellectual property laws, which has been a, a sore point for us to are very robust. But the roots of all that is very shallow. So enforcement of these issues, and I'm sure as a lawyer, you get the will, our will get involved in that. Um, it, we got to remember that uh, it, it's still on, on a shallow foundation. So uh, our expectations then on what China will do, how it will develop, have to be open-ended. Because again, it, as it moves into early adulthood, which we think it is now, it will start to uh, become... Oops. We also found uh, in many boardrooms in the U.S., uh, China kind of has a schizophrenic perspective. Uh, obviously, there's huge developments in terms of uh, probably the most robust GDP, certainly in size over the last uh, 15, 20 years. It is now, as I mentioned, a market econ economy. It's definitely moving up the value chain from low cost, uh, labor intensive industries to increasingly more technology laden industries. And I'll come back to that point. Probably the most exciting thing about China, and you know, China's all about numbers. You know, 1.3 billion people, plus or minus 200 million, you know, <laughs> the size of the U.S. almost. Uh, and what we're seeing is a huge, continual influx of young, 
uh, more urban, more worldly consumers with a little bit of money in their pocket coming into the stream. And the size of that just dwarfs from an incremental uh, standpoint most other markets with the potential exception of India. Um, technology, China in this last uh, global recession, China's stimulus program, which is an interesting story just to compare to our stimulus program, but one of the aspects of it was laden with uh, innovation, R&D, and, and China definitely recognizing it has to move up the food chain, and we think in certain industries it, it is. And as a result, we'll see some emerging new global companies. Many of you have heard of higher companies like that, Lenovo, of course, and we're likely to see more and more as China, just from scale and increasing technology, starts to have more of an impact on the, on the world economy. And what, we're, what you'll see, and we'll talk again more about, is China has more recently turned inward uh, in terms of the domestic market, less focus on the export market. So all of that sounds great, uh, but China has a lot of challenges. Um, you know, certainly uneven economic development. If you look at China, it's about the size of continental U.S. to give you a sense of density. But the economy has been really along the East Coast, uh, almost like from Boston down to Miami. You know, Beijing down to Guangzhou, 70% of GDP, 70% percent of FDI uh, trade historically has been there. So there's a, been a lot more movement west as we see more and more large cities evolve and government push to that. But the uh, wealth uh, disparity is significant. And uh, so they're wrestling with that issue as many emerging companies are. Um, ability to manage that process. We think the Chinese government the Chinese government, is, just like our own government, has multiple aspects to it. There's Beijing, but Beijing's reach is not, uh, not so pervasive as you might think. So local governments, provincial governments are very, very important. So we're dealing with multiple entities in that regard. Strained infrastructure, huge environmental challenges, which I'm sure you have heard of. Too few resources that are starting to suck up more resources. And we see a lot of investment in Africa. <coughs> Uh, by China looking ahead in terms of some of those commodities. And probably the most important issue uh, to China and to the government is that job creation, uh, which then translates to social stability, which is the number one uh, concern and goal. You could help just this one does here. Great. One more. <laughs> So what, what, this, what we found in, in, in our work, um, and still today, China presents an awful lot of challenges both in planning and in running a business. Lack of good market intelligence, although that's getting better, and one of the resources we bring to companies is, is understanding what's going on in the market. Ten years ago there was no information, today there's probably more misinformation about China. Uh, so you have to filter that. Um, Defining your addressable market. Every market's kind of big and growing, but for Western companies, Mack Truck's a good example. You know, what part of that large, heavy truck market can I profitably play in? And in that case, quite small. So we have to understand among the broad market, there's a spectrum of price and uh, complexity, and where does my value proposition play? Um, dealing with a high level of uncertainty. You know, board, what we found board members here have struggled most with making high risk and some significant investment with much less certainty than they would in other markets, and that's just the nature of the beast. Obviously getting access to markets, understanding Chinese business culture, um, successfully adapting your business model. Very rarely can you just take what you do well here and just transplant it as it is in, in China and, and have it be successful. But we, all, we use the term Chinify, Chinify your business model. Uh, and, and that's a key, is where is that balance of how I do it here and how I should do it there, is one click of those things. And I'm sorry, the list goes on of challenges. You know, uh, being cost competitive, I've never worked in a market as cost competitive as China. There's over capacity in virtually every industry. Opaque financial system, you've all heard of you know, two sets of books. And reality is a real set of books is in the, the head of the, the stakeholder, stakeholders of the company in many cases. 
Um, IP, you know, one of the big concerns, particularly of small and mid-sized companies, if I go to China, do I expose my intellectual property and, you know, could that come back and, and really uh, undermine my business? Rule of man versus rule of law. If you remember when you were in China driving or queuing, you know, you'd be in a queue, we're in a nice orderly queue here, and right up, you know, someone will come right up in front because, you know, that's their position, their authority. You know, many Americans in the line, of course, grab and pull them back, and, like me. Uh, unpredictable regulations. Uh, China, you know, export uh, has had a huge impact on, there's a VAT value added tax rebate. Uh, on exports, which historically was VAT 17% in China, 13% of that you could get back as an exporter. So that was profit plus for many companies. Uh, and four or five years ago now, China uh, almost took that off the table, which changed the perspective of many, many suppliers and sources here. Then they put some of it back. And they, so can you imagine the huge impact on supply chain of those seemingly unpredictable regulations? Relationship management, I'll come back to that topic. People think China's cheap. It's not. And that, as a service provider, that's always a, a challenge. It takes a lot to get things done. You have to you know, do more due diligence than you would do ordinarily here. And of course, human resource, which you'll see in a moment, is the number one challenge. So, what you also won't see in, your, uh, in the Harvard Business Review article is some of the subtle challenges that you'll find in China, like conflicting signals is one. <laughs> Leaving some tough choices, okay? <laughs> Do you go in? Don't you go in? You know, so there's some subtlety on that. Um, what we kind of condensed in, in, in the book, and actually there's a, some copies here, if uh, anyone's interested, you just have to commit to read it if you take one. Uh, but, you know, one of the things, that we wrote this, uh, probably five, six years ago at least now, kind of trying to say what, what happened in that first 10 years? What did we learn? And some of those painful lessons in the 90s was very painful lessons for Western firms, particularly American firms. At that time, 50-50 joint venture was almost your only choice. And, you know, CEOs were clamoring at five-star hotels in, the, in Hong Kong saying, you know, we're going to be a billion dollars in China. Then they'd leave and the local guys would say, okay, we better invest. And the Chinese government would offer a, a partner who we, they didn't do the due diligence. And virtually none of those jo joint ventures exist today. Uh, so, and, and, you know, we at that time also designed a lot of naive entry strategies. We were learning as well in China. So a lot of structure before strategy. And one of our mantras, it sounds obvious, but even with Fortune 200 companies, it, they get ahead of themselves on, on structure. We need a plan. We have a joint venture. Someone's approached us. What's the strategy? Uh, structure, uh, it, it should follow that naturally, but so often it doesn't in China. And today, with most markets, you can do about anything you want structurally. Wholly owned, joint venture, uh, franchising, uh, so there's not a lot of restrictions, again, with some exceptions to certain sensitive industries. Snapshot view of the market. One of the big problems is, we always talk about China years as dog years. One year in China is like seven years here. So it goes that fast. So, you know, by the time we said, okay, we forecasted the market, uh, we were right on the volume, but the value of that was 30% less, we didn't make any money. Um, so being able to look ahead to that very uncertain, and particularly in the 90s and, and the early 2000s, that dynamic change was very, very difficult to do. Unexpected competition. I mean, if there was a, a hot market, companies would come out of the woodwork. You know, a restaurant owner in one province would see a fiberglass plant being successful in another. Well, let's get in the fiberglass industry, um, knowing nothing about it. So that created a lot of low-end capacity, but that undermined the price of the market. Lack of due diligence, as I mentioned, in, especially in the 90s. And today, I think we're getting a little better on all these things. But another one of our expressions we use all the time is observe the six Ds. Due diligence, due diligence, due diligence. And in China, the process is the same as anywhere else. You just have to look under more rocks, probably, because the information is less certain and less clear. Relationship management. This is a whole topic in itself. As, as Americans, 
Most of us are, are uh, low context communicators. You know, we say this is black, we mean this is black. And in most of the world, not just uh, China or Asia, they're high context communicators. It, you know, if, if I say it's black, well, it could be a little gray, and it may not mean that. There's a whole network of relationship, and, and it takes a lot of time. And in my experience, we're not very good at that. And we don't spend the time, and a lot of that time's after 5 o'clock, you know, sipping Mao Tai, and, and, uh, and, and it's not easy. But those relationships uh, uh, mean everything in China, certainly more than a contract. Uh, not enough support for the local operation. You know, China, it, historically, particularly, you find it a little bit today, it can be, you know, now it's the, the rising star to it's a negative, and Wall Street will go back and forth. A company may be actively developing China, then their home market has a challenge, they pull back. This was a huge complaint by many managing directors we talked about um, as we did our research for the book. And of course, naive financial planning. So, the, uh, so I painted a picture that it was a rough road to get there, but very, very importantly, today, U.S. companies are making a lot of money in China. Uh, we work with uh, American Chamber of Commerce, which is a, you know, a, a non-government uh, business uh, advocacy around the world. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with different ones. I think Shanghai is the biggest one in the world now, if I'm not mistaken. And we help them do their annual planning and white paper. And last year, and we're seeing similar results so far this year, was a record year for U.S. companies in terms of, of revenue growth, uh, return on investment, you know, operating profit, and that's not fully appreciated here. A lot of, it was interesting, a lot of these results came out when Hu Jintao was here last winter, you know, and there was all this talk about the negativeness of China, no mention of the significant amount of money and the job creation as a result of that, that was happening from that. So the story is not so, so simple. Just another perspective on that. We could do, click it two more times, get the rest of it. Um, and as we look forward, uh, China, you know, the optimistic level, and we've tracked this about 10 years now, uh, is probably never been better. Um, and forecast investment increase, forecast revenue increase, a top three priority for two thirds and one more click, about 20% is the number one priority for uh, US companies in terms of future investment. And the difference I would say with this optimism and optimism say after 2001 when China entered the WTO, it's a seasoned optimism. You know, people, it's not naive anymore. People are walking with a limp, you know, who have been in China. So they know the pitfalls and the traps to that but they still see the opportunity for growth and profitability. Just a couple more. Um, the challenges, and interestingly, if you go back even certainly over the last five years, the list of challenges hasn't changed dramatically. HR during the global recession uh, tempered a little bit, but now it's back on the top of the list. But the difference is you know, Western companies are pretty familiar with these challenges. You know, they've been dealing with them. They know, in many cases, how to wrestle with them. Um, so I think that, that difference is very important. So what we see, there's no reason to go into China naively anymore. There's enough lessons learned, enough experience out there. And even though the list of challenges is pretty significant, um, they, they are addressable. You know, um, certainly HR, IP. Um, a, a new one is this concern on domestic protectionism. Um, and you know, we're monitoring very closely uh, SOE, state-owned enterprises, which are, are now kind of getting a new life, which were the, you know, they used to be the old vestiges of the command economy, you know, just production-based, no accountability financially. A lot of that has been cleaned up, and there's some rising stars making a lot of money that will have some global impact, but the concern is that they're going to protect some areas. Environmental industry is a good in example. It's very hard for a Western company to play in China's environmental protection industry in terms of equipment, technologies, etc. because of some uh, indigenous innovation policy or protection. So that's a new factor that's kind of coming out that's got the concern of some, some Western players. Then lastly, just kind of on this U.S. perspective, um, this, this kind of subtle 
shift that's really cemented over the last couple of years is this in China for China. Uh, you know, China, for many companies, for many years, has been about sourcing or China's all about exports. Um, that's changed dramatically in our view. Not just for Western companies, but for Chinese companies. And again, the last global recession, which I hope we're coming out of, was kind of the last straw maybe where, you know, obviously exports from China declined because of the lack of demand in the West. And many companies, Chinese companies, turned inward. So, you know, our, our domestic market is more robust, there's more opportunity and you know, exports are getting squeezed down and you know, the first cost has just been pressed, pressed, pressed. Not as lucrative as it used to be. And so we're seeing many companies, Western and Chinese alike, saying we need an in-China, for-China strategy. So that's, that's really changed uh, in, in, in subtly and more deeply in the last few years. Just a, a quick comment, uh, China has a cycle of five-year plans. They just initiated the 12th, uh, 12th five-year plan. And you know, there's a lot of the similar kinds of um, terminology, but some key differences uh, is, again, in this domestic innovation, uh, moving up R&D, and China's capability moving up the food chain, if you will, in terms of technology, uh, trying to deal with environmental issues, which I think is recognized as a severe problem, but you know, dealing with those, balancing that against economic growth, is challenging everywhere in the world, and certainly in China. Um, you know, dealing with that Western China development, go west, you know, but the market's still very east, so other companies don't want to go west. Um, modernization of the transportation system. China's infrastructure, you look at the roads, um, are, are significant. Uh, you know, there's, there's about 70 million cars on the road in China versus 200 million here. If you did a, a ratio to ratio, you know, cars per person in China to here, there'd be a billion cars on the road. And I think traffic's rough enough in places like Shanghai and Beijing, so that's almost unimaginable. Um, but, you know, they're building that infrastructure rapidly, and it's quite impressive. Ports, very, you're talking about port development, very, very impressive. Oh, yet yeah, there's still some vestiges of, of inefficient, uh, you know, the rail, modern high-speed rail, which has some hiccups recently, huge development, and then moving heavy rail for more freight, moving passengers off of that. Airports, the Yangtze River development, a lot of development there and a lot of, of progress yet to happen. So we think there'll be some, you know, some significant changes. Again, more of this domestic focus in terms of the government. Okay, where is China going? You know, one of the big questions we get asked is, you know, right now China's the number two economy in the world. They recently achieved that status, number one auto market in the world, you know, thanks somewhat to the U.S. going this way, but still China was getting there anyway. So depending on what your, 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 your GDP outlook is, we, you know, we think that China will be 7% plus. It almost has to be uh, to generate the kind of jobs necessary for stability and, you know, whatever the U.S. might be. So by 2020, by 2025, by 2030, there's a pretty big gap. China's almost about 30% of the GDP of the U.S., uh, so there's a big gap, but, you know, that, that, that's moving rapidly, moving rapidly, so it's just a matter of time, you know. China will have hiccups and they'll have challenges, but it's not going away, so it's just a matter of time where China will be, and it was, three out of the last 4,000 years, the biggest economy in the world, so if you get your perspective a little bit stretched, you can see that. So what does that mean? Uh, Today, there are over 170 cities with a million or more people in China, which is hard to imagine right there. 50 more of those will come into existence, and they come in very rapidly over this 10-year this period. 150 million new urban consumers, young, more brand conscious, a little bit of money in their pocket, um, uh, internet savvy, uh, so that's, again, got the attention of certainly every consumer product company in the world. We talked about the rail system, 100 new airports, 
thousands of additional kilometers of highways already had a good system. Another quarter billion of cars on the road, and we monitor that segment quite uh, rapidly. You know, but uh, rising labor rates, uh, which from an export standpoint is certainly an issue, even greater environmental problems, even less resources, and that strain on infrastructure that goes again back to that balance. How do we manage this growth? Because we have to grow, because we have too many people not to grow. So how do we manage that? And that's again, it's not going to be a smooth road. We think it will be a progressive road, but it, will, it won't be linear in terms of development. All right, lastly, uh, just to, wanted to uh, highlight a concept uh, that it's, it's it expanded certainly in the book that came out of our research and our early naive experience in China. Uh, what we found that a lot of the failures of Western companies in China were not due to external problems or challenges, of which there were many, but rather internal. Uh, and this is particularly true for small and mid-sized companies as they look for China, where they don't have the depth of resources or the bench strength in terms of management. So we kind of came up with a, almost a Myers-Briggs type of outlook saying, what am I, type A, type B, type C? And uh, you know what we found is kind of two matrix, two axes. One, what is our motivation and the urgency of that to go to China, and how ready are we to get there? And what we found as we do an analysis of companies that it's always hard to say most, but many small to mid-sized companies are type Bs. But what does that mean? That means I need to go to China, either for defensive reasons, my customers are going there for growth, but I'm not ready. I don't have the resources, the experience, I have IP issues, what do I do? And you know, the, the obvious, you gotta find a way. And that's the challenge for much of American uh, uh, companies now at that small and mid-sized level, uh, and, and for some Fortune uh, 500 companies as well. So I'm gonna just unpack this very briefly. Um, you know, why do I wanna go to China? You know, and we found that there's four and a half drivers to that. One, obviously, new market growth. And that's been for Fortune 1000 companies, certainly the major incentive is that, you know, not many markets in the world are growing, where do we go? But increasingly, and we found this especially for small to mid-sized yeah. companies, it's customer pull. Yeah, is I found that my customers oh, are either setting up over there, there. Go ahead, just or, and so I, I, you know, there's an opportunity, or they're shifting their manufacturing from here to there. If I don't go, I've lost my market. And for many companies, and automotive is a classic example. General Motors goes there, a TRW or Delphi goes there. Oh, now, what about that next second tier, third tier supplier? There's a family run, $100 million, $50 million firm who gets the call saying, we need you in China. And you know, most management doesn't have a passport. You know, they grab a map, you know, where is China? And, and you know, what, and then when they find out when they go, there's not enough business from that customer to support them. But if they don't go, what's the threat? Someone else is gonna go. And so that's put a lot of strain, and again, that, that's resulted in that type B kind of conclusion. Competitive threat, of course, not just from Chinese companies coming here, but from international companies who go there, change their cost basis, and now are more competitive than I am in the West. So competitive threat comes from a multiple sides. Obviously cost savings, which is now starting to change a little bit, because China's not so cheap, certainly for low value add, products. And then the kind of half driver stakeholder push, which we found was a, a false driver many times. You gotta be in China. You know, and you know, people rush, spend money without doing the due diligence. But you gotta respond to stakeholders, whether it's Wall Street, the board, you know, the, the senior management, and come up with a with a strategy or a plan, an argument against or an argument for. So it, so the, what we found is that for most companies there wasn't one driver, okay, but there were several drivers of different levels of importance. And the key is to, the, to judge the urgency of it. So if I don't go to China, what are the implications, you know, in terms of threat and opportunity loss? Because if I do go to China, there's opportunity cost to that. And if I'm a small to mid-sized firm and I got to send my engineer main engineer to China for six months, that means he's not here for six months. 
So it's a big issue. So we got to develop. We got to understand through you know analysis and workshopping what's the, the urgency level of some of these motivations. Okay. Then lastly, and this is kind of a, a busy chart, but basically just to give you an idea, readiness, organizational readiness, we broke into uh, three. Sorry, four different baskets of issues. You know, from operations. I, I, and obviously, if I go to China, I've got to do what I do here, there, in some form. Is that transferable? Or if I transfer, am I going to lose my intellectual property? Is it transferable? Does my brand work there? Is there a market for my technology? So we've got to understand that element. Uh, financials. You know, if you're going to China to save your business, good luck. You know, do I have the pockets? to do it. We often say with a small and mid-sized company coming, so are you ready to spend a quarter million dollars discretionary expense to see if you should be in China? So if they don't go into cardiac arrest, then you know we have, we'll go on to the next conversation. But it's a, it's a, a wake up saying, you know, you gotta, you gotta spend the money and the time to do it. And a lot of that's just time and out of pocket. Management debt, as I mentioned, you know, especially with small mid-sized companies don't have a deep bench. Uh, so if I send my engineer or my key guys in, or the CEO, he's spending months in China. Uh, and to do relationship right, you need to spend that time. That means he's not here. So what's the, can we afford that? Um, and then level of experience. And this is one area where companies underestimate what they have. They look at their circle of, you know, their own su supply chain, their board, uh, other stakeholders, uh, advisors, they tend to have a lot more China experience and connection than they may think. And we've seen a lot of companies go to China together. A, a supplier and its customer will go together. Um, and we've seen companies like PPG, DuPont, uh, Delphi, who have been very, you know, kind of, we will set up the operation and the, the government connect, all the hard stuff. You come to their suppliers to support them. So we've seen a lot of that development by looking at your circle of friends. So again, the idea is in the thinking is to say, well, where are our vulnerability areas? What's far from the bullseye? And those are the things we need to address. I and mean, if we're in that type B, we gotta find a way. And there usually is a way. There usually is a way. That's, I think, the encouraging news. Okay. Just some, well, let's skip this one. There's a couple of clicks there. But we just found a lot of our analysis and. The, the workshops we do in this in the morning, it's about, you know, the motivation to go and everybody's rah, rah, rah. It's like the first half of a U of A game. Everybody's optimistic and enjoying it. And then in the second half, they realize, well, what's the cost to do it? And are we ready? And then everybody gets depressed and then you kind of find a way at the end of the day. Okay. Just some last thoughts. Um, so what do we do? Well, one, yeah, and I would say, again, for most companies, is we need to resolve what China means to our business, our customers indirectly, our business then. And we need a proactive decision. You know, whether, okay, China's not, I, can, I don't need to deal with it, or I need to deal with it in some way. We gotta be proactive about it. It's just too important of a market uh, on your business, whatever, almost whatever it might be, to ignore. Difference today uh, uh, is you gotta bring your A game. You know, uh, best practices, you know, to, China is now competitive and, and tough enough as a, as a market where you got to bring your best people, your, your best practices, your lean processes, you got to bring the, the good stuff if you want to be successful. And then some principles. I mentioned, you know, I'm required by licensing agreement to say it three times a day. Usually I say it a couple times to my wife. Strategy before structure. Um, develop a, a, a dual strategy. We didn't talk about this earlier, but many companies, we did do a lot of research on this, those who were sourcing from China and doing business in China and had integrated those supply chains were you know, six to eight points profitability higher than those who were doing only one or the other. So very interesting uh, kind of research. Uh, become a strategic sourcer. Again, we didn't talk a lot about sourcing. As China moves up the value chain, we need to source differently, more direct. And again, that's a, a, a talk in and of itself. Focus on relationship management. Um, again, we have to spend the time, we have to spend the time there and observe the six Ds, due diligence, due diligence, due diligence. So let me leave you with a couple pictures, images that might capture everything. So 
the goal <laughs> may seem a long way. All right? And you gotta you gotta get to that goal. Okay? And then it's not always what you expect when you get there. <laughs> One of the things with these, with these signs, uh, and we always try, you know, a lot of times it's a mistranslation where we have our people look at that sign. It's an exact translation. So I don't know what it means, but I observe it. <laughs> but in the end, the, again, our last phrase, our mantra is in China, everything's possible. It really is, but it's not easy. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you.